We're in this special, thank you, season of uh, prayer, and I've been invited on this occasion to speak on corporate prayer, praying together. Uh, Tim last week spoke to us about our individual prayer life, a great privilege, each of us individually, uh, to come to God. And uh, we're going to talk this morning about corporate or praying together. Okay, so I'm going to read to you from the book of Acts and uh, chapter 4, where we get one of the early church prayer meetings, a wonderful uh, church prayer meeting where they start calling on God. And they started calling on God because these early apostles had known Jesus, had conquered death. He's actually beaten death. He's alive. They killed him. They slaughtered him in the most dreadful way, unspeakable way, just hanging on a cross, dying in shame and nakedness. Uh, and they thought, well, that's the end. That's the end. And then suddenly he's alive again. And uh, he says, look, I've conquered death. I'm, I'm alive. Now go and tell everybody. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Go and do it. And they start, they start seeing hundreds of people converted. They see a dramatic healing, uh, just like Jesus was doing. Now they're doing. And then suddenly, they are forbidden. You don't do this anymore. The Sanhedrin, the ruling authorities say, hey, cut this out. We've had enough of this. You're making trouble. Don't you ever dare do it again. So that's the end of the church. That's the way it all stops. Uh, no, what I did was they went and prayed. So we see a wonderful example of what early prayer was like. So I'm going to read from verse 18, I think. When they'd summoned them, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than God, you be the judge. For we can't stop speaking about what we've seen and heard. When they threatened them further, they let them go, finding no basis on which to, promise, uh, to punish them on account of the people, because all the people were glorifying God for what had happened. For the man who'd been healed was more than 40 years old on whom the miracle of healing was performed. When they'd been released... They went to their own friends, companions, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, Oh Lord, it's you who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why? Did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand. Rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly, in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Now, Lord, take note of their threats. Grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they'd gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Father, we thank you so much for this account of the early church, those who first put their trust in you. We thank you for your availability to their prayers, that your accessibility, the immediacy of the answer from heaven. And Father, Lord, we gathered here this morning in Jesus' name, and we do pray, Father, for the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher, make relevant to us, Lord, in our day, in this 21st century, the power of this truth. Let it come home to us with power and relevance. Come, Holy Spirit, speaking to our hearts, we pray. We ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, a lot of uh, church groups that at the moment are having special seasons of prayer. Uh, Jim and I were gathered with about 25 pastors 
uh, from the New Frontiers group this last week and just hearing around the circle, several of them are saying, hey, we're having a special season of prayer. We're having 21 days of prayer. We're having two weeks of prayer. We're having a week of prayer. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of that happening at the moment. Pete Gregg's written this outstanding book and, and the whole awareness of corporate prayer is coming home to us. Even one of our own guys, Mike Bitz, Betts, has just written The Prayers of Many, a book that's just been published. Uh, and just talking about people coming together to pray. And you see that so early in the New Testament church. Funny, when Jesus was walking the earth, you don't see him praying with the people, his disciples even, but when the Spirit came, wow, did they start praying together. I'd just like us to note straight away, what is a prayer meeting? Well, it's not a religious duty. It's not just some sort of boring endurance test. No, it can be like that. When I was first a pastor, I was invited from a, a church in a place called Seaford to become their pastor, and I went to the Tuesday night prayer meeting. It was terrible. It was the, the most dutiful handful went, and the guy got this list and prayed through this list, and it was awful. And, uh, you know, just went because you were supposed to be there. It wasn't much fun. Very different to this. And then actually in the church, people began to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and the Holy Spirit was coming on people in a new way, like he did in the early church. And we started another prayer meeting on a Friday night. And God was so manifestly present. It was awesome. The sense of God is here. A faith began to grow. The sense of God's power began to come. God began to transform that church on the back of a new way of praying. Praying... It's an exciting thing. It's not, it's not a due to, oh, I have to go to the prayer. Do I have to go? A prayer meeting. Or some could see it like a, a pious kind of withdrawing. from The battle's out there. Let's go and just have a pious time. Let's have a, even a charismatic time away from the battle. In the book of Acts, it's not like that. In the book of Acts, it's where the battle's fought. It's not a withdrawing from the battle. It's where the battle's won. It's, it's an action time. You look, at all the, you look at the prayer meetings in the book of Acts. They're all geared to action. So Peter's in prison. It says they, in, they just instinctively gathered to pray. I mean, that, what do you do when a guy gets in prison? Well, oh, go and charge, go and shout, run away. No, they prayed. That was their instinct. They prayed and prayed and prayed. He came out of prison. The prison opened. He was set free. Why? Well, press. <laughs> That's where the action is. And the story I've just read to you, this prayer is where the action is, where the battle is won, where the breakthrough happens. Prayer, the prayer meeting is the power source of a church on the move. If a church isn't doing anything, of course the prayer meeting's boring. I mean, these guys were on, they've been given a commission from Jesus. Go and tell everybody about me. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples. Go, do it, go and do it. They had a commission, they're on the move. That's who they are. There are people on the move. If the church isn't doing anything, well, of course the prayer meeting is boring. What should we pray about? I don't know. My, my sister's got a toenail coming out. Should we pray for her? We come together, I don't know, what should we pray about? Oh, I read this last week. Oh, I thought that. Oh, it's, it's like, the, I wonder if you ever saw the Monty Python thing, the Monty Python uh, little video thing that they did in the old show. When they write, line up for a, uh, a race, they all line up for the race, the guy shoots the gun, bang, and they all walk off in different directions. Have you seen that one? It's hysterical. They're, they're just going all over the place. When prayer meetings are like that, it's not like this one. They knew what they were doing together. They're commissioned people. So praying is really part of it. Praying is where the... A man called Paul Bilheimer wrote a terrific book called Destined for the Throne. And he says this, Prayer is where the action is. Any church without a well-organized and systematic prayer program is simply operating a religious treadmill I don't want to be in that kind of church, do you? I want to be where the action is, where God's moving, where his power is being released. I must confess, I have for a long time believed in corporate prayer. I, I, I believed in it. I saw it happen when we said, let, let the Holy Spirit come amongst us, teach us to pray. Uh, something in my experience was uh, uh, back in the, uh, about 1980, I was invited to draw uh, near to a group in Brighton. There were 37 people. 
and uh, we started to meet in a school in Hove. And uh, it was pretty cold on the weeks that the caretaker forgot to put the heat on. And uh, it was a pretty grim place to be, but we began to grow. Uh, and we went from 37 to about 75. Uh, and, and I thought, wow, we've got to get out of here some point. Uh, and one day I'm walking, I'm walking along in Hove, and there's a, a building called Clarendon Church. Uh, and I know this church because I'd preached in it many years before. And it had a hall that would seat, I don't know, maybe 400, 500. And it had lots of adjoining halls, children's areas, upstairs, rooms everywhere. Amazing place. And I happened to know there were only about 25 people meeting in there now. And, and I, I'm walking past, I thought, that's the place for us. That's the place for us. Uh, and I'm with my friends, a guy called Henry Tyler and a guy called David Fellingham. And, and I said to them, I believe that's the place for us. Let's pray. And the three of us, we got on our knees and we prayed. We said, Lord, give us that building. Give us that building. We want that building. And I can't remember how long we prayed for, and I can't remember all, but I do remember this. There came a moment while we were praying, and I remember sitting back on my heels and saying, we've got it, haven't we? We've got it. And Dave and Henry, no one was pushing anybody. We together knew we've got it. It's, that's pretty exciting. We've got it. What do you mean we've got it? Well, I know God's given it to us. And so... I thought, what do I do? how do I do anything about this? And do you know, within a couple of weeks, I had a phone call from the pastor whom I'd never met. And he asked if he could see me. I thought, sounds good. I said, yeah, come and have a meal with us. He came to the meal, and I thought, um, now how am I going to get him to talk about his, his building? And after a few kind of pleasantries, he said, I've heard about your growing congregation. Oh, have you? I wonder if you'd be interested in our building. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> would we be interested? <laughs> Within a couple of months, a bit of talking together, we were in there. This is now our new place, our new place to meet. Our new place. Look at the space we've got here. We don't have to keep carrying things in and out every week. But when we got there, dry rot everywhere. The, to the phone had been taken out because they hadn't paid the bills. It was in a real mess. And so it's such a big place. Rooms here, rooms there. What do we do? Well, we'll start on this room. We're starting to pray. What are we going to do about this? Well, we need to pray. And I guess about 70 of us. I don't know how many families that represented, how many wage earners. We said, right, let's going to pray. we're going to pray. We're going to pray for 20,000 pounds and make a start on one of the rooms. And uh, we, we used to have these prayer meetings once a month on a Sunday night. And I thought, no, I don't want it once a month. I want it far more frequently. And I want it, I want it before the Sunday. So I found that the prayer meeting was beginning to get alive in the spirit. You know when that happens? It's beginning to come alive. People are getting an appetite to pray. You can feel the momentum once a month on a Sunday night. So I, I doubled it up. We're doing it twice a month on a Sunday night. And, oh, yeah, let's do that. And, and people came because there's some momentum, momentum. Then I thought, no, I want it before. So one, one week I said, from now on, the prayer meeting is going to be Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. So there's a few people, who oh, Saturday morning, that's the one day I get to get a lie in, Saturday morning. Anyway, they made it. And we had enough momentum. It began to grow. It began to grow. We had it in a hall. We put all the chairs in a circle because we're in this together. It says here in the Bible, they gathered, they came to their own, they came to the people they were with. And, it, and we didn't push anybody, we said, we're going to gather. And after a while, it grew so much, we had row upon row. I met Andy Cottingham the other day. He said, do you remember the old Saturday morning prayer meetings? I said, oh, yeah. He said, if you didn't get there on time, you wouldn't get a chair. You had to stand at the back. I remember Matt Hosier saying to me, that's where I learned to pray. There's a number of pastors now scattered all over the UK. They would say they learned to pray there. They learned to pray there. We said, Lord, we're going to take an offering tomorrow. We're asking for 20,000. We're all praying for this. Lord, give us 20,000 tomorrow. We're praying for 20,000 tomorrow. Well, with us, 20,000 was huge. I'm talking about 1980. I'm talking about a gang of people who, I mean, if there was a wealthy man there, I never met him. And we prayed, and why, tomorrow we take the offering. And, you know, during the prayer meeting, I'd say things like this. Do we feel we've got it yet? 
Do we feel, do we feel, no, not really. Like, come on, let's keep praying. Let's keep praying. Have we got it yet? Have we got it yet? Because we're in this together. We're together. This is the one the thing we're going for. We're going for this. And then they say, yeah, I think we've got it. I think we've got it. Just an hour of prayer, eight till nine. Next morning, take up the offering. Wow, we hit it, 20,000. And then we did it again. And then we did it again. And then God spoke to us in prophecy and said to us in one of these prayer meetings, raising the money for this building is going to be the anvil on which I hammer out faith in your heart. You're going to learn faith and prayer on this anvil. And we began to learn to pray. We began to cry out to God. We began to see it happen week after week, or at least three times a year. Three times a year. And then we began to see we need another place. And we went for the big warehouse like you did here. The big warehouse in the heart of Brighton. It used to be a comet warehouse. And we went for that. And now, hey, now, now we need 100,000 three times a year. You look around and think, wow, that's a big call. That's a big call. And so we're saying, right, we're going to pray. We're going to pray for 100,000. And in those days, we just had one offering day. We had one meeting the following day. We're going to pray for 100,000. Well, just, some people said, come on, it's a big deal. Let's go for it. Let's pray for it. And we're praying. And I guess by that time, we may have been about 150 in the prayer meeting. It's beginning to grow. It's beginning to grow. I used to pray as a pastor, this is honestly true, I used to pray for the prayer meeting as much as I prayed for the Sunday meeting. As we went through the week, I'm praying, Lord, come to this prayer meeting. Come on Sunday. Come to this, because I knew what happened in the prayer meeting. It's where the action is. It's not not that religious thing you have to do sometimes. We learn it's where the action is. It's where things happen. And I remember we were praying and praying, and I felt God whispered into my heart, you've got 100, pray for 200. And I just said it to the people, I think we've got 100,000. I think, I think we've got it. Let's believe God for 200,000. Let's do it together now. And we began to pray, pray together for 200,000. And I remember the next day getting the letter through my letterbox from the guy who took up the offering notes and did all the adding up and all the rest of it. And that, that day, I opened the envelope. What do we got? 245,000. I remember my knees gave way. Ooh, we got it. No, beloved, we learned to do it. God taught us. I, we, we learned to do it. We're in this together. We're together. We're praying together. Go for it together. It's what we're, it's what we're going for. It's what we're believing for. It's not just a prayer meeting. And I'm loose today in the prayer meeting. Is this week we're praying for Auntie Flo. Then we're praying for this. Then we're, no, we've got a vision. We've got a purpose. We've got a meaning. We've got a calling. So we're on a move. We've got to pray for it. We've got to pray for it. So then we started raising three times a year. 100,000, 100,000, 100,000. Because we want to get this thing paid for by the end of the millennium. That was our goal. Get this thing prayed for. Get it paid for. We don't want to have anything going over into the... We want it behind us. I remember we were doing it three times a year. It was so exciting. People were learning to pray, getting excited about it. I remember the next, the penultimate offering, the mid-year one, some idiot said, let's give this one away. I thought, what? Well, it's what generous people do. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's crazy. No, come on, let's give it away. You know, you can't, as you know, the leader of faith, say, no, no, we don't do that. No, okay, let's do it. <laughs> so we gave away that 100,000 to all sorts of people all over the world. We gave it away. That means you've got to raise 200,000 for the last one, which we did. And by the end of the millennium, we had no bills to pay wow. on that. It was done. It was done. <laughs> now, it's so important for us that we believe God and we focus. They were praying, and prayer was where the action was. Prayer wasn't some dutiful thing. It wasn't a thing with no goal or purpose. It wasn't, let's come together. What should we pray for? Let's see. Is there anything we should pray for? We have a commission. We have something from God to do. And so we prayed. Well, here in this early church, let's come to the story. There's a context. They're told, you mustn't preach anymore. 
It's over. This is the Sanhedrin. This is, these run the nation. You're not to pray anymore. Then it says in the text, they, they returned. Actually, it says in the Greek, they returned to their own. I looked at the various translations I've got on my desk, and the NASB says they returned to their companions. NIV says to their own people. ESV says to their friends. The actual word just says to their own. They went, they went back to their own. It's not called church even yet. In the book of Acts, it's just these, these Jewish people who know that Jesus is alive. It's a kind of spontaneous group. They were together. You'd see them at the temple, like, even from house to house. There's recognizable people who filled with God. God's with them. They're amazing people. And so they gathered to these guys that they were together. They weren't a formal church yet. The word, you just keep reading the word together in early Acts. They gathered together. They were together, together. They haven't got a church building. They got, they're together. They said, people who know that Jesus is alive, uh, and all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to God. And so we come to this particular prayer meeting. It says in verse 24, they lifted their voices with one accord. NIV translates it, they lifted their voices together. See, togetherness is so important in prayer. It's like a rugby scrum. I love watching rugby. I never played it, but it, I played well. It's an incredible game. And you see these guys lock together. Uh, and you realize that the locking together is what makes them powerful. And that's what we see here. They're together. They're locked together. They're in this thing together. You find in the commentaries, it says it's rather like there's Roman armies. You remember when the Roman armies were going to battle? They come to a certain time. They put the shields up over their heads. And round the side, they were like a, like a tank. You couldn't, you could, because they're together. This Roman army conquered the world. They learned how to fight. They conquered the world. They, no one had ever fought like them before. They locked in. They just pushed forward. Battle after battle. They were locked together like a rugby scrum, like an army. And they weren't praying their private things, if you like, in this prayer meeting. They're, they're focused on this, this goal. We want to keep making Jesus known. We've been told we're not allowed to. We're not allowed to. It's like us with the building in Brighton. We're told, you can't have it. You can't have it. So we prayed again. We were told it's refused. It's been refused by 100% refusal by the Brighton Town Council. And we just kept praying and praying and praying. And they turned over. We turned the thing over. It was, the church is so excited. We did that. We did that. We prayed. We turned it over. There was such excitement in our ranks. We accomplished that together. You see, you don't, you see, prayer meetings get killed if you're not together. If someone prays a long prayer, you know, when you first go to a prayer meeting and some experienced prayer gets up and prays all around the world, oh, God, bless our brothers in Kenya, bless our brothers here. But you sit there, when's he going to finish? You know, and then nobody else goes all around, all around the world. You think, no, no, that's not together. We have to learn to pray together. We learn to have to pray in one another's prayers. If, if I'm an hour prayer meeting, I'm praying all hour. I'm not saying, oh, she prayed what I wanted to pray. Oh. No, we're in this together. And when you pray, I'm praying. I'm praying in your prayer. And when you pray, we're, we're, I pray all hour. We, we're in one another's prayer. We're together. And it's maybe they lifted their voices together like they're doing Korea. They lifted their voices together. We, we were first surprised when one of our friends went over to see the amazing church in Korea that had grown to a million and had this prayer testimony. It's not like it's a secret thing. It's not like nobody knows about this. They had such prayer. And they built a church of a million in Seoul, Korea. It's prayer is the key. And our friends went out. Malcolm Kays went out to have a look. And he came back and said, they all pray together. They don't one and then another. They all pray together. So it may be that's how they pray, that maybe they all lifted their voices together. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we all pray together. Sometimes we come on, let's go for it together. Let's go for it together. Now, I find that it helps me to hear so I can identify with what some people are praying. So I like it when we do all that. You feel that sense we're in this together. But I think sometimes a people, a man, a woman, gets a gift of faith in the prayer meeting. 
And they kind of articulate something, say, yes. And, and your faith is growing on the back of people grow, praying. They maybe quote a scripture in their praying. We'll come to that in a moment. And as they quote that scripture, faith stirs in your heart. And you begin to say, hey, I can't believe we've got it. And then something else happens. And, and so we're in this experience together. We're moving forward. We're being led by the Holy Spirit. And faith starts growing. It's a dynamic thing. The prayer meeting. It's a dynamic thing. Motivated, led by the Holy Spirit. We're in it together. We're praying with one another. We're listening to one another. It's a bit like a conversation in a sense. You know, in a conversation you stay with a theme when Wendy and I pray together, that's praying together, just husband and wife. I want to encourage you, do it. Do it together. <laughs> do it together. Then we, we would pray like you might have a conversation around the table. If you're having a conversation at the table, you, you wouldn't sort of say, did you hear about how Liverpool did last night? Then you hear, yeah, the flowers are growing nicely in the garden. Have you noticed? Uh, wait a minute, I thought we were... You don't talk like that. You don't say, oh, did you see the moon last evening? I, I thought we were having a conversation. In a conversation, you're, you talk about how marvelous Liverpool are for a while, especially if you're with Jim, and uh, you, know, you stay with the subject for a while. You say, did you see that guy got baptized this last week? Whoa, what about that? Um, and Dan Walker managed to get it on Football Focus. Well done, Dan Walker, Christian man. I thought, yeah, let millions see it. You always say, we talk about that for a while. And suddenly, in your conversation, it sparks off to somebody else. And so we go there for a while. We don't pray all around the world each. So when Wendy and I are praying, we may be praying for our kids one after another, or we're praying for the church here, we're praying for Jim and the elders, or we're praying for some of the brothers, and we will move subject to subject together. So in a prayer meeting, it may be that, right, we've prayed that one through, and we begin to feel led to something more, and we pray that through together. We're in it together. They were together. It's one of the big features of corporate prayer. We're talking about singular, if you like, prayer last week. We're talking about corporate prayer this week. They prayed together. Faith rising. Faith stimulating one another. Then let's see, what did they pray? They prayed, Oh, sovereign Lord. That's their opening line. Oh, sovereign Lord. So it starts with an encounter. It's like Tim was talking to us earlier in the meeting. When you come to ask things, you need to, to get a real glimpse of who we're asking from, who he is. These fishermen from the north, they're northern fishermen. They're not at home in the big city of Jerusalem. They're strangers. They're, they're just, you know, they're country folk. And here they are with this commission from heaven. Go and tell the world about Jesus. <laughs> And the authorities, the Sanhedrin, say, don't you say another word. Well, I mean, the setback is huge. We're not allowed to do it anymore. That's the end. And, and not only the fact you're not allowed to, the emotion, the emotion that, ah, oh, gosh, this is hard. What's this going to... You see, that happens, dear friends. It ha can happen before you come to the prayer meeting. You just heard that one of your kids has just had an accident, or you just heard that your, your grandfather's in Syria. You know, you hear things, and you can't think, oh, wow. Wow, I'm a bit... Well, now we're going to pray for... Oh, yeah, let's pray for... But you're down in the dumps, because life is hard. Life is <coughs> tough. There are setbacks. And so when you pray together, the first thing you do, hey, sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord. And beloved, it's not just a few facts. Oh God, you created the heavens and the earth. That's what they pray. That's what they prayed in the Old Testament. Jeremiah said, Oh Lord God, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power. Nothing's impossible to you. We used to sing a song saying that. You made the heavens, you made the earth. Nothing's impossible. Now that's the truth. That's a fact. But I not only just need to know that in my brain, which is very important, but I need my heart renewed. I need to engage with that. I need to know that's relevant to me now. It's not just a fact, a theological fact, yeah, he made the heavens, that's interesting. No, it affects me. And I need that in my daily prayer myself, personally. But when we come together, that's not, beloved, why we just say, oh, let's sing a few songs before we, before we pray. 
Uh, well, you know, a couple of songs. You go, oh, no, no, no. All right, now we're praying. No, I need to, I need to get my eyes on God. Yeah. When we're, I need to engage with him. I need to say, oh, Lord, you did, nothing's impossible to you. Even this Sanhedrin, nothing's impossible to you. I need that in here. That needs to happen in the prayer meeting. That needs to, I'm seeing God. I'm feeling his power. I'm feeling his relevant power is relevant to me. He's all powerful. Nothing's impossible to him. I need to feel that, know that. Now let's start praying. That's what we need, beloved. We need to engage with him by the Holy Spirit to see how wonderful he is, to feel it, to feel it energizing me. Make it, hey, nothing, there's nothing you can't stop. Who do these Sanhedrin think they are? That's what happened with Joshua. It comes, it comes, Joshua came to Jericho and he says, boy, it's walled up to heaven. Then he sees the Lord. He, he bows down, says, God, wow, God. Oh, those walls, nothing. Faith, by engaging with him, seeing him, celebrating him, enjoying him. Oh, sovereign Lord. The word that's translated sovereign Lord is a Greek word, despotis, from which we get our word despot. Now, despot's a pretty ugly word. We think of African potentates, despots, who robbed their nation, got terrific power. No, no, it just means all-powerful. All-powerful. It's like, you are the all-powerful one. And they prayed to him. They said, look, you did. You made the heavens and the earth, everything that's in them, you re-engage your spirit with who he is. And then the next thing you see in this prayer is, you said. Notice that? Who you said through David, your servant, by the Spirit. In other words, Scripture's inspired of God. This is God speaking. You said. And if you look at what they quote, they're quoting from Psalm 2. It's very important. We know Scripture when we pray. So we're not praying around the will of the wisp stuff. What has God said? He said... In Psalm 2, I've set my king on my holy hill. I've said to him, rule in the midst of your enemies. Ask me, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. And the bit they quote as well, hey, the, the heathen are going to rage against you. It's all in Psalm 2. But there'll be opposition, there'll be difficulty, and they interpret that. They say, yeah, Herod and Pilate, they, they came. It's like it says in the Psalms, this would happen. But you put your king on your holy hill, Lord. You're the Lord. We're coming to pray to you. We're coming to ask you. They quote scripture. They come to God reminding him who he is, if you like, and reminding themselves who he is. And remembering, dear friends, that they were not running a club and trying to get God interested in it. There's a wonderful book by Christopher Wright called The Mission of God. It's a wonderful book. In it, he says, we so often think, well, we're trying to get this started. If only we could get God interested in it. And he really sets out, hey, it's not our idea. <laughs> it's his mission. It's his purpose. God so loved the world, he gave his beloved son. God said to Abraham, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. It's God's mission, and we, we just need to catch up with who he is, what he's doing. And that's what they did. They said, Lord... You said, you said, you said to your son, today I've begotten you, ask me, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. It's all there in Psalm 2. So they prayed in the line of what God has said. They lined up with what God has said. That's so important when we're praying, dear friends. That truth in our hearts stimulates faith. That's why it's good for us to know the Bible, to know the promises, to feel them, feel their strength, to feel their weight. They stimulate faith for prayer. And they don't, they don't pray, oh God, crush these guys, smash them. They don't say, Lord, show us how to escape. You know, just what they did pray. They didn't pray, get us out of here, Lord, this is dangerous. They prayed, Lord, grant us boldness. Why? Because you told us to preach. They told us not to. They said, you said, no, Lord, come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. They're back in touch with the one who has real authority. Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. 
the Sanhedrin and saying, hey, we've got the authority, cut it out. And it's in prayer that we demonstrate who's in charge. That's where we demonstrate who is the real king. Jesus said, go and make disciples. They said, don't you dare speak. We've got authority here. It's prayer that demonstrates who's got the real authority. They prayed, God, come on, Lord. Come on, Lord, stretch forth your hand. Grant us boldness. Give us boldness. They, they knew, hey, we're in danger here. We're in a scared place. They just killed Jesus. What could have happened to us? They asked, Lord, give us boldness. And God gave them boldness. God came. God came with tremendous power. But let's just see one more phrase before we see the answer to prayer. Now, Lord. I'm just looking through this this week, looking at it, praying through it. There comes a turning point, if you like, in the prayer. Now, Lord. Verse 29. Now, Lord. All, all, this, all this relevant, you are the Lord. You created everything. Without you was nothing made that is made. You made everything. On the heavens, the earth, the seas, you made everything. Lord, you're the Lord. Now, Lord. I've got, we need a now that reaches up into that and pulls it down. Now, Lord. That's the wonder of prayer. Now, Lord. Now, if we remember Elijah. Lord, send your fire. It comes. He's vindicated. Fire immediately. Then he's praying for rain later. Lord, send the rain. Not a sign. Sends his boy. Go and have a look. No, nothing. Lord, you promised rain. You said you'd send rain. Let's go and look again. Goes and looks again. Nothing. Seven times. And then it came. Do you know, that's still a now, Lord. That's still a Lord. Come and do this. And sometimes it is immediate. Sometimes it's immediate. I had the joy last week. I was in a church in Chertsey and praying for the sick at the end. Immediate, immediate. Arthritic knees completely gone. Someone who couldn't move their head. They did immediate, immediately, immediately, immediate healing. Sometimes you have to keep praying. Keep praying. But you don't let, oh, well, what's the point? No, there's praying that prays through, prays through, prays through. Believe in God, not letting go. We pray, we see God work. Prayer is where the power lies. God wants us to learn this more profoundly. That's what Jim and the elders are feeling. Come on, let's learn this more. Let's learn this more. Let's learn to pray together. Let's lay hold of God together. Let's engage together. Let's believe for stuff together. Beloved, we're in, you know, we've been commissioned. We live in terrible days. Terrible days. In spite of the massive abortions, the killing of thousands, millions of children, still in England last year, more children were born out of wedlock than in. That's the state of our condition, our, our nation. Teachers have to teach children where you choose which gender you would like to be. I had a teacher sit with Wendy and us the other day, sat and he's, he's almost crying. I have to teach this. I have to, by law, I have to teach this. You don't know if you're a boy or a girl, you can, you know, and maybe you'd prefer, and if you, you know, you, I have to teach this. I hate it. I have to teach it. You speak to a nurse, you say, I'd love to pray. I'm not allowed to pray. I can't even wear a cross. Hey, what's going on? We are being pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. What used to have Christian values is gone, it's gone. Hey, we ought to be fighting. We've got so much to pray about. There's so much to pray about. Wendy and I watched the program Chernobyl the other day. I'd not seen it before. Amazing. Power broke out in a power station. And the energy from that power went right across the whole area. Sickness, trees dying. You just saw this power go out and out and out. I want to believe God that power can go out from here, right across Mid-Sussex, that we, the schools get affected, that big people begin to say, what is it with these kids who come from that church? They seem to be different, they seem to have got their lives in order. What are these teenagers? They seem to have a different value system. 
We need to have impact right across this neighborhood to see it happen, to see it happen. Beloved, in a sense, we've seen something of it. We started what we call New Frontiers with one church. We now have over 2,000 churches around the world. We've had a prayer emphasis, prayer emphasis, prayer emphasis. Let's believe God together. Let's take it on board. Lord, what do you want to do with us here? Surely, Lord, you've put us here. We're well known now. People know the blue building. Thousands come in and out. Oh, God, give us. Why don't we believe God for Why can't we believe God for us? A baptism every month. Can't we say, that's a goal to go for. Let's believe God. We're going to see people baptized every month here. Let's have goals. Let's go for it. Let's believe for it. Let's say, Lord, I want to see that happen. <coughs> I don't want to be like the Monty Python thing. Bang. Oh, we go over here. Someone go over here. Let's be... We're focused. We're after something. We want to believe it. The excitement of getting what we ask for. Wow, God heard us on that. Yeah, everybody gets strengthened. We learn to pray. We learn to obtain. Corporate prayer is so exciting. It's so amazing. God wants us to learn it. Mike says in this book, I just received it through the post yesterday, I think, or the day before. His opening chapter is about revolution. He says, let's start. It's called The Prayers of Many. It's about corporate prayer. And uh, he's saying we've got to learn this. And I'm fascinated. His opening chapter is called Revolution. And he said, we live in a press button age. You know, if my phone isn't coming on quickly, ah, it's rubbish. It's taking like 10 seconds instead of one. We, we are quick. We expect things now. And he said this. In his opening chapter, the French Revolution took 12 years. The American Revolution took 18 years. Arguably, the Industrial Revolution took 80 years. Revolutions don't happen overnight. And he's saying so helpfully in this book about learning to pray together. You don't say, hey, switch it, now we got it. He says, we've got to learn. It's very good, very wise. We won't immediately catch it, but let's get on the journey. Let's get on the journey. Mike Pilavacci says on the back of this book, Mike's written a great resource, which once again will place the prayer meeting as the engine room of the church. The prayer meeting as the engine room. Our poor nation is so confused, so bewildered, morally completely lost. The church is the light of the world. You can't expect the government to change morals by changing laws. The church must change the atmosphere. By God's given us his spirit and amazing promises and one another so we can pray. I'm going to pray, then we're going to sing. Perhaps the band could come up while I'm praying. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for this mighty weapon. We thank you what in your mercy you've given us. We thank you for every answered prayer we've ever known. And Lord Jesus, we, we do want to ask you, please, will you help us? Would you come amongst us? Would you focus us, inspire us? Would you give us big dreams of what could happen, what you want to happen, what you want your church to be? Oh, Father, that we might Glorify your great name. Help us in it, Father, we pray. I'm just, I'm just reminded of something that happened to Jim and me this week. We were at a conference, and uh, because of incredible weather, a storm broke out and a tree fell. And on this conference hall we usually use, all the lights went out, all the power went off. Uh, everything just went I said, well, what are we going to do? They said, we're just phoning around to see if any of our sister hotels has got space. And they said, we found one. It's 10 minutes away. So we all, about 25 of us, we all went off to this other place. Well, this other place, I tell you, it's amazing. I mean, I've never seen anything quite like it. It's like, whoa. It was built 150 years ago, apparently. It, may, it makes Downton Abbey look like a semi. I mean, it's just... <laughs> It was staggering, staggering. 
And we're in this, we're in this place. Of, and so we're there for a whole day and a night. And then we got, we got, we got the, the next morning. And I'm going to the room. And they said, um, you can go back to the other place now. I said, uh, well, can't we stay? I mean, she said, oh, it's all done. They got the power back. You can go back. You can have your lunch there. And, you know, have your meeting there waiting for you. Oh, we've got to leave there. <laughs> and she said, she said, you could stay if you like. I said, oh, could we? She said, it'll cost a little more. I thought, okay, it cost a little more. And that came into our prayer meeting the next morning when we were with these brothers. We were in a magnificent place. I tell you, it's amazing. I, talk, I brought pictures home to show Wendy. It's just a, ah. But we went back to the other place. And God really spoke to us. God really spoke to us. Would you like it like that? Yeah, I would like it like that. I'd like your church like that. It's what it says in the Bible. Your church is glorious. Well, it'll cost you a little more. It'll cost you a little more. And that stayed with us. We prayed like anything as a group of guys. We prayed like anything. Lord, give us more. Let it, let's let that, let, let it make the wow factor. That in their literature, come and use this place for weddings. It has the wow factor. Sure it has. I'd love the church to have the wow factor. What have you got here? Well, it's just going to cost you a little more. Let's learn the lesson. Amen. Thank you.